All right, we're going to start um, because Priyanka has a question that I think is really relevant to the chapter. Um, kind of, you know, it's not directly re related to the exercises, but it's a great question for us to discuss. So this week we are talking about uh, the, the chapter three lab and exercises and kind of just a discussion of chapter three, whatever might come up. I'm not sure yet. We haven't done many of these yet, so we'll see how it works. And uh, right away, Priyanka has a question about like how to interpret uh, dummy variables in linear regression. And I, I remember we briefly talked about it when we were kind of talking about the concept of dummy variables of what the heck do these mean and how, you know, why do you have the one that you leave out? Um, so, okay, with that, restate what you were just saying, Priyanka, before the recording uh, cuts, comes in. So let's, let's start right. there. <laughs> sure. So, uh, yeah, my, my question, um, I guess I, I just have to repeat the question, John. Yeah. Okay. So I want to understand, um, how would you interpret the coefficients or, you know, like the result, your, your, uh, uh, regression model results in general, uh, specific to the variable, which has been dummified, for example, you know, if you're looking at a categorical variable, which is coded, coded or recoded such that you have left off one of the variables, or if you have seasonality, season or month variables, you know, taken off in that sense. Um, so yeah, and I guess Kim had some inputs for that. <laughs> Go on, Kim. I was saying, oh, don't make me repeat it now. I don't know what I said. Um, no, I, I just said, I, I got the, the, the sense that the, the dummy variable was, you leave one out and then everything after that is, if the dummy variable is, is present, then the, the, um, the result is, well, uh, with respect to the one that's been left out as a baseline, that's how much you decrease or decrease you'd expect to see with whatever level of confidence. Sounds good. Right. So um, I think you had the example of uh, months. And let's say that your, your left out is January. Mm -hmm. That would mean that basically, um, like... It, the, the rest of the model is describing January, like all the other, you know, all, everything that's going on, the baseline model is January. But then mm -hmm. if you have February as one, then the, um, you know, the, the coefficient for February is uh, adding on to your model. It, it's adding on to your prediction. Um, first, and then if you have March, that coefficient is adding on to your prediction. So it's, it's, um, like how much does this month have an impact as opposed to January or, or oh, relative yeah. to January yeah, or whatever okay. your zero is. Sounds good. Yeah. Mm, sounds good, sounds good. Does anyone have any other thoughts around that? Um, it is, it, it's, I don't know, it, like why do you leave one as zero was very confusing to me until I finally um, like internalized that okay, that is the baseline level. You're, and it, you know, it can be weird because you're, you're saying, what is the default? Um, right. You know, in a lot of mo models, for example, the default is probably white dude. And then you put variables on top of white dude. And that's mm -hmm. very re relevant to this because this Boston data set that they used throughout the lab <laughs> is a super racist data set. <laughs> and I'm so surprised that they still use it in the book because um, they, they, they take out the variable that is particularly racist that is how black is the neighborhood is a variable that's in the original data set and it's um you know they leave it out because that's obviously a problematic way it, variable especially the way that it's in the data set it is um transformed in the original data and it's difficult to pull it back out there are articles all about it and the, the reason that the data set's even more problematic is that people went back to the original data and can't reproduce the that problematic variable which has a, a separate data set than the original data set or a separate source so it makes you question the whole data set and why are you using a questionable data set for teaching when there are lots of other data sets so I, I i got i went down this rabbit trail for uh for this whole thing when i was like wait um because the tidy models version uh of the the lab mentions that it's quite outdated and contains some really unfortunate variables. So I was like, wait, what? Um, 
I just thought that was really interesting. I also found that the the actual um, outcome variable apparently is uh, appears to be capped at fifty thousand, and so anything that's fifty thousand or above, they just coded as fifty thousand. So it also causes problems for modeling. It's just a weird data set to use as the like the first real example of let's use this data set to do modeling. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really it's odd. Like if you look at this the B variable that they leave out, it's like what? <laughs> like they do this weird transformation on it, and there's this whole blog post about how the way they do the transformation you can't reverse it, and so you can't find what was the original variable. Um, but it's from the census, and so they do this whole thing anyway. Uh, that's an aside, but it 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 really like it. I, I got obsessed with it for a minute just based on this. Wait, it's problematic? Why is it problematic? Um, and it makes you think about, I don't know. It, it's really surprising to me. This this book just came out with a second edition. Why didn't they choose a different data set? Like they could, there's the Ames housing data set that is basically the same, same idea, just different variables. They could have switched it out. So um, <laughs> that's just something that I saw in this. Uh, before we dive into like the lab and figure out what we're going to do with exercises, just is there anything that anyone wants to to say about the chapter, the exercises, the lab that they found interesting? I guess I can ask another question. There. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess another thing that I uh, always sort of is is not clear in my head. And uh, by the way, uh, thanks, John, for, for bringing the previous point when you said why that thing is not clear. I guess when you, when you said that the base thing, like, you know, why you leave one out the, the base, I guess it's now said that now helps me as well. Like I can see with the context of the interpretation. Now it makes sense because now you're keeping one baseline and then you hence you leave it out and then you are looking at everything else with respect to that. So, okay. Um, now moving on to so my next question was I somehow find it difficult to, um, you know, let's say even answer a question when, when we look, when we do modeling on a imbalanced data set. And again, I'm not sure if it is partially relevant to this topic or, or not, but I guess it is. But um, so when, and in, in, in a normal scenario, a lot of times you would get an imbalanced data set, right? So for example, if you're looking at how many people signed up to the app, right? So, so many people would have downloaded, but there is only a small percentage that downloads it. But when you do different experimentation, you go ahead with the data that you have. And then um, theoretically, I've seen, I've heard that the solution to that is resampling, but I don't, I don't really understand how that process would really work. So if we want to take it now or maybe in the future. I, I think let's save that because that they're going to, um, I mean, I haven't read chapter five yet, but I'm pretty sure that's a lot of what chapter five is about. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, that is a problem. A problem in real-world examples that um, you know they will certainly. I, I really hope that they go into uh, well. So, um, so the next thing was I. So, you know, we've got uh, uh, August recommended a couple of um, like uh, solutions guides for the exercises, and I also grabbed. Um, uh, Emil Hviltfeldt is writing, or has written, I guess, um, tidy models versions of the labs. And um, I haven't worked with in base R in a long time. So was, I actually went through this lab as written in the book in base R and went, oh, right, um, base R is different. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty interesting to go through. Uh, the... Like base R plotting, especially I never do base R plotting, and it's so it doesn't feel like R to me because of the way that you're like adding to the same thing just by calling new functions. It's so different than you know normally when you call a function, you don't change the original value, but when you call a plotting function, you change the plot. Like you're adding onto the plot. It's really weird to me. Um, so anyway, uh, in the actual lab, did, did anyone have anything else that really, oh, I guess I had one other thing that stood out, but I'm gonna let other people say, have anything that stood out? 
well, but Python is more of a modify in place language in general. Like you are modifying the object that you're working with. And so it, you know, that plotting in R feels a lot more like Python to me than anything else in R. So in base R. Um, Sorry, that was from the chat that uh, August mentioned that plotting in Python is similar to that. Um, the other thing that, I don't know, I don't mean to be like complaining about this <laughs> through this whole exercise, but the that they did this uh, fifth order polynomial and just kind of said, oh, it looks like they're all uh, important and kind of left it at that and didn't go into and we really shouldn't use this model because this is ridiculous. There's no way there's actually a fifth order interaction on this semi made up uh, column that we have here. Because by the way, this is also a somewhat problematic column. It's the lower status column of this data set and they kind of define what it means to be lower status. So um, I just, I don't know. I found it really surprising that they, they're like, oh, there's this fifth order effect of the percentage of lower status people in the neighborhood and just left it at that. Um, personally, like it, uh, there was an example last year where the White House put out a COVID model that was clearly, they just, you know, they did this. They they took their formula and they said poly and they went up to three and got a nice curve that they liked. And so they said, that's the COVID model. And it's not a third order polynomial. Like there's no, you know, there's no, um, theoretical reason that it would be and it's kind of it's very made up to do that so i don't know <laughs> i'm going off on this chapter but i thought that was really weird that they didn't say be careful doing this you're probably overfitting if you're going into some crazy fifth order polynomial does anyone else have thoughts <laughs> All right, so um, I mentioned last time that basically what I wanna do, I mean, we can kind of just walk through the exercises. We won't get through all of them. Um, does anyone have anything in particular from the exercises that they, they looked at and wanted to talk about? Uh, does anyone have, you know, anyone have ideas of what we should do while we're here? Because if not, um, I mean, a couple of things we could do is I could go through the tidy models version to show how that's different from the one that's in the book. Um, we could just walk through the exercises. What do people want to do? Let's. Oh, man, that's a tough choice. I feel like both of those could be helpful. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to vote for. Can we split our time, do a little bit of tidy models and then some exercises? Let's okay. Let's we'll go ahead and start with the tidy models. And I've got another vote there for tidy models. Um, it, yeah, okay. So we'll jump over to that. So I think it is helpful to, you know, if you haven't done the lab, that's okay. But I did find it really helpful to do the lab as written in the book and then look at Emil's version and kind of see the difference. Now, the other other way of looking at it is, you know, the idea of tidy models is it's supposed to be an easier system to learn that kind of stays consistent uh, throughout everything that you're doing versus every model, if you're using base or if you're using different modeling packages, every model has its own idiosyncrasies that tidy models tries to kind of level them out, make everything kind of the same process. So, all right, um, there is this, uh, GitHub book of the lab, the ISLR labs written in tidy models. Um, I will share this in the in our channel. Actually, I'll probably bookmark it in our channel. It is really uh, helpful to have. So the, the first thing, obviously, um, you have to library tid tidy models. Um, he, this is written using ISLR 1 right now, but I believe he's updating it for 2. Um, and you can tell that because he's librarying the old version of their package, not the new version, which I think is effect almost exactly the same. Um, all right, so the the big like the big difference between um, or a big difference with tidy models is it's it's written more for the pipe, 
So if you're not familiar with piping in R, uh, this will be confusing. Uh, just think of the pipe as the words and then. So you're doing something and then you're doing something and then you're doing something else and you're kind of adding them all together. Um, and so the idea here is you, you make a specification for a model and then you use that specification to fit your model, predict things like that. And hopefully this will make sense as we go. So the specification here is we're saying we want a linear regression. And then he um, formally set, sets the mode to regression because we want to start doing this consistently. Linear regression can only be regression. It can't be classification. But he does this. Um, he, he formally does this to show the process. And then specifically, the type of linear regression that we're doing is LM. Um, so it's as if we're doing the LM function. If I let me see if I can kind of hop back and forth to show the equivalents. Um, so this is um, we're not quite to here yet. And this is why a lot of people are skeptical of tidy models, because for something really simple like this, it's definitely simpler to just do the base version, but the idea is that then it's consistent when you get, if you're doing XG boost or if you're doing, um, you know, well, actually, and other boosted trees, or if you're doing different uh, tree models, or if you're doing uh, GLMs or anything, it's the same process. So, all right, so we've got this specification and then we fit it. So you take the specification and fit it to the actual data with the formula. Um, so now at that point, that LM fit is the same as this LM dot fit. Um, does that kind of make sense so far? Any questions about that? All right. Um, this is actually like a parsnip model ob object. Parsnip is the like actual modeling piece inside of tidy models. Um, and so he shows that you can pluck out the fit and then that that fit that's inside of the object is exactly the same as lm.fit. And you can do, like you could do a summary of that. And it's the summary um, should be, I think it's exactly the same numbers, yeah. Um, so this exactly the same, but then the advantage is now we've got um, like tidy from broom. Well, tidy can work with any LM object, but all these things are written to to work with this object. So we can tidy it. We can see a nice, like easy to read version of the summary. That's basically what tidy does here. Um, we can glance and see all of those uh, statistics, um, including fit statistics. And um, <laughs> they do, he does kind of the same thing that they do in the book where he make, does some things to produce errors, but then you can predict with it by giving it some data, you know, do the predictions just like they do in the book. We can give it a confidence interval and it'll give you the upper and lower bounds on the predictions. Um, and we can, um, so he shows that we can do this bind columns thing where you take the prediction and um, you do the prediction and the the um, original data set and then predict, pull out the ones that you want. But that's also exactly what augment does from Broom. And so we can take, uh, oops, sorry, take the um, model, the fit model, the new data, uh, use that to augment the model. And then we select these, we can just see our predictions. Um, and that's, that's, Basically, the idea. Um, John, like is there like a yeah. good cheat sheet, as, you know, for 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 this, and maybe especially for like comparing to base R approaches? Um. Yes. So let me see if I have this handy. Oop! I just closed the tab that has it. Uh. So if I grab the right tab. Um, 
I find I have found this helpful that uh well, yeah, this isn't this won't fit for exactly here, but someone from R4DS has been come, kind of putting together like notes on um different models within tidy models and um walkthroughs of those models and lots of notes about them. This spreadsheet I will share. That's not exactly an answer to the question you had though. Um I mean the book, <laughs> Tidy Modeling with R, is a good walkthrough of how to use tidy models. Um, and I think walking through Emil's examples is, is a really, it's a good way to build up to it. One thing that I was going to say here, like everywhere, a lot of how to use tidy models um, reflects the history of tidy models, which is unfortunate. And they, they updated the book to not do that. They've gotten to a point in tidy models where it's easy to use, uh, it, like about as easy to use as it can be, which, um, which can be complicated. And you want to use workflows. You want to use the package. Uh, use uh, so use workflows or use tidy models. Um, it's uh, apparently I don't have it installed on. Uh, this computer use models. Um, they so they have a package use models which uh, will like set up your um, boilerplate code for tidy models. So you can say I want to use. Um, well, actually, it doesn't matter for LM, but if you're say using XGBoost, you can just call this use XGBoost function, and it'll set up everything that you just plug your code into. Um, so that's kind of like a walkthrough. Uh, they have um, within Parsnip, there are, is a um, an uh, uh, RStudio add-in that uh, has Parsnip. Uh, there's a Parsnip underscore add-in function, which is a shiny app to help you create a um, model. So I'm not showing the screen, but um, let me see. Let me see if I can get you the, the or show the code more easily. Let's see. Let's switch over to that screen. What's that? Yeah, that's that. So there's this uh, parsnip add-in. Are you seeing this, the shiny? Yes. OK. Um, and so this makes it fairly, again, fairly straightforward to write parsnip code, because if you're trying to just write this model specification, you know, the example that Emil did was the linear regression. And I can say write specification code, and it just like sets it up. Um, versus let's say we wanted to do a couple different ones and it shows you the, the different, uh, setups. Um, and if I actually, I think if I had had this focused on, yeah, if I had it focused here, yeah, it puts the code into wherever you're, you're writing code. So they've done a lot to to work on, I don't know, the reusability, the things that are kind of standard, um, if that makes sense. All right, so let's go back to, to Emil's code. Um, here is it starts to get into uh, kind of the reusability of tidy models, that he has this LM spec that, you know, we defined up here. Is... We're still seeing your R Studio. Oh, sorry. Yep. Let me switch back. That's good because I um, didn't have the right thing handy anyway. All right. Um, so we defined LM spec up at the, you know, originally. And it's just this is a linear regression using LM. And so now LM spec is like that, that boilerplate that when we get to the multi, multiple linear regression, we're taking LM spec and we're fitting with a different formula. 
And then, you know, again, from that point, if I switch back, uh, sorry, skimming through, um, you know, it's basically the same at that point again. That is, you're just adding that onto this specification. And that fit is just like a, a normal fit or a base fit. Um, and then they do one that's against all variables. So um, I didn't actually, I don't remember what, what that outcome variable is. Um, median value, duh. Uh, so median value by everything. And again, you can do that just like you do in base R. Um, that, so can you um, help me understand what this spec uh, object really contains? Is it just saying do a linear bit? Yeah, so it means, you know, linear modeling or, or for, for LM, it doesn't mean much. It doesn't, it's just do a linear model. When you have something like, um, you know, a, a XG boost is the a, a good example that there are lots of things you want to tune within that. And so the specification includes and tune all of these variables, tune all of these hyperparameters. Um, as we get into later chapters, it'll make a lot more sense, I think. Okay. But it, it is just the specification of what type of model do you want to work with? Gotcha. Um, and, and, you know, basic things about that type of model. What do you want to bother tuning? What do you want to uh, not tune that you want to keep this thing fixed because, you know, for whatever reason? Um, and then, so you take that spec and then you fit it to different data with different specifications of um, how you want it, the actual model to be. So if we look at the interaction terms, again, you can specify the interactions there. Um, but then he gets into recipes which is things to do to your data. So there's things to do like the specification of the model. And then there's data preparation. Recipes is about data preparation. And so he's saying, you know, we can take our data, which we're saying, this is our formula that we want to look at the data. And then we add this step interact for LSTAT to age. So you know, want to interact by LSTAT and age. Um, so that you, they could have just put the interaction in the original formula, but this is like saying, oh, let, let me, I forgot to put it in. First well, let me add it and it, yes, and it's it separates it out to make it clear, and it works with, um, it, it, uh, I'm trying to find, um, it, it, it like, it does, uh, I don't have a good way to say it, but it, it um, again, kind of make sure that those transformations happen cleanly, um, happen to like, you can, you could also change the data in the recipe, for example, that you can run the same recipe on um, new data. That's the important part. So you define this recipe using um, your given data, but if you collect new data, you can run that new data through the same recipe and it'll do the same um, transformations on that data. And then we get into the part that, um, again, like makes a nice, clean, usable thing out of tidy models, where we get into workflows. And they take, you know, this object that is a workflow, and add the model specification and add the recipe. And now this workflow, they fit to the Boston data. And that shows, you know, the outcome. And then the idea again is that now this workflow object is the full process. And so when you have new data, you send it through the full process and it'll uh, modify it and, or it'll, um, you know, do any feature engineering or whatever you do on it and then uh, pr predict on it. And so the workflow kind of control contains the whole thing. So let me, let me see if I'm following this so far. And anyone else jump into the questions too. I'm just trying to like <laughs> here. So far I understand there's like three kinds of objects there's like a model specification object, a recipe specification object, and then together we make a workflow object out of these. Is that, is that, that accurate? That is accurate. 
Um, and then we take that workflow object and we run it through okay. the fit function to say fit and probably other things too that we can do with it. Yes. Yep. Um, and again, it is, it's going to be weird because uh, we don't gain anything yet out of tidy models. So uh, in a really simple baseline model, base is probably easier to work with. Um, but I think when we start getting into some of these later chapters, coming back and looking at the tidy models versions um, will make more sense because it stays the same. Like the steps you do stay the same no matter what the model is. All right. So the next thing they do, they show another one where they're doing the the squared uh, version of LSTAT. They add that as just another um, thing in the recipe. And now they can make a workflow using that same specification. But now you've got a different recipe and fit that. Um, and you can do step log. And yes, there. So, um, Sri Ram shared the the learn uh, section from the Tidy Models website. There's also Tidy Models with Tidy Modeling with R, the book. Um, TM, yeah, tmwr.org. Uh, we have book clubs for that. So, if you're interesting interested in that, um, I I did them. I don't know, kind of in the wrong order. That uh, Tidy Modeling with R kind of assumes you know what modeling, how modeling works and is teaching you how to use tidy modeling for modeling versus, you know, ISLR is teaching you how to do modeling. Um, but they're both very useful books and it has a much less racist data set. So it's nice to use. Uh, and David says that as a tidy models convert, the real power comes when you're doing lots of different model types with different specifications and or want to do tuning and model implementation independent fashion. Totally agree um, that it's not that useful if you're just going to be doing, well, especially if you're just going to be doing linear regression, but if you're just going to be doing one type of model, um, tidy modeling doesn't have that much useful with it, but if you're switching between different types of models, um, if you want to, you know, if you're tuning parameters, if you um, are doing a lot more like complicated, you know, if you're doing some of the resampling, that's where tidy modeling gets really useful. Um, so basically, by the end of the book, tidy modeling is useful. This chapter, probably not so much. Although I, I do like that, you know, I, I was poo pooing it, but already by this point, he he's reusing the same objects and showing us, you know, okay, here all that really changed is the recipe. Like every otherwise the process is the same. Um I think probably okay, yeah. So it um this is a the qualitative thing is a totally different section in my mind. So any questions so far? Any thoughts? All right. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so just in general, so there's also um, the, another thing that August shared is an um, a tidy tidy version of ISLR one, which is specifically like tidy verse, not tidy models, but they're they're showing how to work with pipes and everything, and and it's got broom in there, but it's not. I don't think it's updated for the full tidy models. Um, universe. So there's kind of various ways that you can do this. Um, I, I, I am really liking the tidy models way of doing things um, for switching between or for keeping this, the process standardized um, pretty much no matter what you're doing. All right. So then there, they talk about the qualitative predictors. Um, he shows pretty much um, exactly what they do in the book, except in a tidy format. So you take the car seats, you pull out the um, variable you want to look at, and see the contrasts, or um, let's see. Oh, yeah, he uses that same LM spec because it didn't care about the data, um, but takes a makes a recipe where he dummies 
all nominal predictors and then sets up an interaction between uh, you know some a couple of different things and then he can run the fit on that um, and again like the step dummy uh, cleanly looks for things that are dummyable it's all nominal predictors anything that's not a number basically um, and uses that to to build dummy variables um, and then yeah he doesn't go into writing functions because there are lots of books about that such as R for data science um well so there is this step interact function so federica asked if there's any difference in fitting interaction terms between classical model and tidy models so um you can do it using um you know within the the formula style just like in base r you can set up the formula that tells that has the interactions in it um or within the recipe you can say these are the things that i want to interact and again i find it personally I, I find it less confusing to pull it out in a step um it is tech you know there's it's more code it, it's more to type but it's much easier to read in my mind that you can see it formally oh yes i'm doing an interaction um so there can be a difference there doesn't have to be a difference <laughs> Um, anything else about the tidy model stuff? Um, oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, can you hear us? I think. Okay. Oh. Sorry, uh, I have. Um, I don't have my headphones. So. <laughs> um, I found the difficult I found with um, step interact is that when when you choose uh, the variable, so you need to you, when you do this, um, for example, in this case, in com uh, to advertising, the the columns, the, these predictors need to be uh, so the the step taking step taking all the variable all the predictors from income to advertising for example in, in case that more than one right and then add price add price to age I, I i don't wait this is a different um convention here right like it's not the like one colon three which means one two three here the, the colon means something else here right john right so here it is saying an interaction between income and advertising and an income an interaction between price and age it's not the variables from income to advertising yeah that's a good that's a good and it is point of possible confusion to highlight because it is using something that often means something else in our that it it often means something else specifically in the tidy verse but within it's because there's the tilde you're in a formula um like a, a the same as a base r formula and within a base r formula the colon means interaction between these two variables did that make sense yes but, uh, whatever and then um i had a further interaction with these other two but, so, I mean, if I, uh, um, because I found some difficulties, uh, uh, if I do income, um, Collins advertising means I'm, I'm interacting just these two variables and not any other, for example, forget right. the other right and things after that. Uh, right. So, uh, um, again, I think it's partly that we don't have it yet to see the interesting things and they sh he should have added that really and we might have to um put it a request in because in the example in the um the help for step interact they show it's a different data set so it's different um variable names but i'm pasting it into the chat that you can do things like the starts with uh selector 
And so they show, I want to have an interaction between body mass G and every variable that starts with species. And so that is, again, where you can start doing more complicated ways. You can use selectors from tidy selects um, to find, you know, I want to do, um, I'm trying to think of uh, like, you know, <laughs> You, you could do um, all of contains, um, you can do um, uh, like, if, uh, you, could, you could make something really confusing <laughs> where you have, I wanna do all of the vars from this variable to this variable, and then a colon meaning a different thing interacting with all the variables from this variable to this variable. I don't have that code right in front of me, but you could um, do more broad interactions that way with, with the tidy models way of doing things. Um, and if we remember, ask that question in the channel and we'll pull out the code there. I just, I can't do it off the, on the fly. Um, I don't want to screw things up <laughs> basically. So, um, yeah, let's not do any pathological formulas yet, please. Yes. <laughs> but we can't, it is possible with um, the tidy select selectors to get um, multiple variables and you can do, you know, more, more interactions um, that way. Uh, when you start, so one thing to watch out for when you start doing, if you're going to do a linear model, and then you're adding in a ton of interaction and you know you're also going to high order order polynomials at that point you're losing the value of doing a linear model to because it's not going to be that interpretable anymore and so you have to watch out for how crazy in, in my mind in my opinion if you make a linear model super crazy then it's not worth doing a linear model anymore you might as well do like a boosted tree or something um you know, there's a balance, but, uh, all right. So, um, any other questions on the tidy models stuff or thoughts? And there we go. Yes. So you can just say, um, uh, step interact. Oh, you're echoing Sorry. again, but yeah, you Sorry. You type uh, it. I see. Uh, I said uh, you might want to use just all predictors. If you use right. just all predictors, uh, that that's in general, no. But uh, in particular, when you do a research, you might want to just choose one or two predictors. So uh, that was interesting to understand very well how to select these predictors. And, and put it inside because you can just use the double columns between two and then you can add a plus and do another double columns then you can you don't use the um any other signs i don't know i'm just asking i, yeah. I need to to, to look a bit more uh, in depth about this so. um yeah so yeah you can you can with with tidy or with recipes, which is what step interact comes from, you can do, you know, lots of, of these relationships and you can add variables that way. And recipes is basically the feature engineering package. So if you want to do things to your data um, in order to fit it. Um, and yeah, so Sriram says that the, the word step, um, if you don't, if you don't know tidy models, that can be really confusing that it is a step in the data preparation, not like a stepwise uh, regression or anything like that. It is the step underscore from recipe, uh, from tidy models. Um, those all are steps of processing um, that you do to your data. All right, anything else? Looks like we're good there. So next, um, I wanted want to talk about the exercises. I didn't make it through all the exercises. I told everyone to get go through the exercises so we would be ready to talk about them, and then I didn't. Um, 
So does anyone have a particular exercise they want to talk about? I guess let's first load up the exercises. If not, um, we can start walking through them live. We've got about 10 minutes. So ideally, if someone does have one, that would be great. Uh, let me get down to them. Um, anyone? OK, well, let's just start walking through. All right, so the first exercise was describe the null hypotheses to which the p-values given in table 3.4 correspond. Um, okay, we're gonna jump down to, to exercise 10 because we have a re request for that one. So let's take a look down in the applied section. Um, using the car seats data set. Okay, so imagine we that we have um, fit it or, or how do you fit it? let's let's talk that out so we've got um this library islr2 um oops you can't see my screen but i'll get there in a second and we want to use that's the car seats right that's in oops yeah that's a data set that's in islr2 um so if we're going to fit a multiple regression model to predict sales using price, urban, and US, uh, using, let's say, let's say using, let's go with the tiny models, models right? version. Yeah. yeah. So, um, oop, what did I just do? Okay. Um, I wanted to go to LM spec gets, oops. So, um, You can't see my or the screen where I type type to this, but LM spec number one. If we're using uh, tiny models, this is the same no matter what linear regression we want to do. Again, set mode is redundant. You don't technically have to do that, but um, it's it's not bad practice to kind of have a standard process that you walk through. Are there and other it, modes that you could put there? So not regression? not for linear regression. Okay, so that's the only one, but right. Um, so if you it, like a lot of tree models can either be regression or classification, for example, um, I don't know. Um, the way they write the docs, they say, for example, classification or regression. I don't know if there's ever something else that an engine could do, but um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if we get into examples where they do something other than regression or classification. Um, and then we set the engine to LM. Um, so again, so it's linear regression, but theoretically there could be more, um, and there can be more linear regression models. So there's LM, there's uh, Glimnet, there's Stan, there's Spark, there's Keras can be used for linear regression. So, um, those are the engines that are kind of built in with tidy models for linear regression. Um, oh, that's actually a useful thing that uh, tidy models has. Actually, I'm going to switch to my other screen to show this. Um, that there's this function show engines. Uh, so for linear regression, I can show all the engines that are available and it shows the modes that are available. So if I do, um, uh, let's see, hold on a sec. Go to parsnip and say we want to do um, boost tree. So that shows you examples where there are more types, more modes. Um, you are seeing my screen with the show engine, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Is looking at some other examples, so you can see that you know different models or different engines can do different modes. Um, technically, this this LM spec is whatever all that is this exactly the same as that um, because LM is the default engine. Regression is the only mode that LM can do. So therefore, if you just say linear linear reg, that is um, exactly a linear model. 
specification. So, okay, we've got our LLM spec. Um, and we wanted to do, whoops. Uh, we want to fit a multiple regression model to predict sales using price, urban, and US. So um, let me go, let me go grab the uh, multiple regression example. Um, and multiple regression really just means there's multiple predictive variables here, right? Right. And so we are working with, um, uh, we have the car seat data set. Is that what we're trying to do for this? Yeah. And so they're saying we want to predict um, uh, uh, sales from price, urban, and US. So that would be sales from price, urban, and US. Our data is car seats. And there we go. Uh, now, in right. this case, we didn't set up an explicit um, like recipe object. We just put the formula directly into the fit. Yes. Um, we could have done it other ways. Yes. Yeah, so let's uh, let's do uh, um, workflow with um, set model right or not uh not set what is it add model see i haven't i haven't written enough code to just have it at my or in was my it head. step was it step because the, the confusing it's, it's not hold on a sec it's add model yeah add model uh lm uh spec and then oops we want to add recipe but we haven't defined a recipe yet so let's do that before this we say recipe um or uh, car seat recipe is a recipe. Um, and we just want to do uh, this. Right. Yes. And we're not doing anything, you know, we're not really doing anything with the recipe here, but we could do it like that. Uh, what did I, did I? Should we do I, pipes, not pluses? Oh, geez, yes. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Okay. So if we do, um, yeah, okay. This is a, uh, uh, that's not a fit. There we go. Um, uh, okay, so eventually those are Yay. exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, and th so there is the confusing, a little bit confusing thing here is that the recipe has data that it's like based on and then the fit has data that it's based on. Most of the time, those will probably be the same thing. Um, but the idea is that the recipe, you also have a lot of situations where you're training the recipe. Like one of the things you can do in a recipe is for factors, drop levels that are rare, basically. And just or, put all maybe put like all those... normalize normalize something right or, or yeah so you might um like you know a lot of times you'll you'll you know center your data or different things like that and you want to center it based on the training data and so you're training the recipe that you use to um to fit your data like you know let's say you want to say how far is this variable from the mean instead of saying just what is this variable um, the mean is defined based on your training data in that case. And then even new data would be saying how far is it from the mean of the training data. And when you say training data in this case, you mean specifically the data specified in recipe creation, which could well, be different from the data you used to um, fit. So technically, fit. technically, technically, I don't think, let me check. Uh, so we are fitting, oh, no, we do have to give it data, but it, 
it doesn't like we are fitting it to that data. Um, we're fitting both the recipe and the model to that data because it doesn't usually make sense to do it different. You can do it different. Like you can pre, you, there are steps to bake your, or to prepare your recipe separate from workflow, but they are pushing people away from doing that anymore because it just oh, makes okay. things more confusing. And yeah, more I can't imagine doing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good reason for it. Yeah, so. Yeah, so so parse so tidy models is a collection of packages, just like the tidyverse is a collection of packages. Parsnip is the core, like modeling package within tidy models, and then there's and Parsnip is the, I think it's the oldest of the tidy models packages, and you can kind of see he was being cute early on, and he got less and less cute as he went. So Parsnip is because it's this like update to carrot. And so it's a different type of carrot kind of, it's another vegetable. And then he was, he had parsnip. And so then they made recipes and they're like, oh, we're gonna, you know, prepare our data using recipes. And they had all these prep and bake and juice things in it. And people were very confused by that. And then they added like tune and workflow. And they, they're like, okay, let's stop being cute. And we'll just describe the package by what it actually does. So tune is for tuning hyperparameters and workflows. It's for making workflows. Um, and there's workflow sets is like kind of the, the last piece of um, the whole thing where you can do lots of model training all together. You take a set of workflows and run them all at once. Um, so I yes, they started out with these really cute names and um it's been interesting to watch like he has normalized a lot of things that used to have confusing names um live and learn uh yeah the 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 part of snip one is just it's so bad carrot had i can't remember off the top of my head what carrot means but you know it has a meaning c-a-r-e-t classification and regression something something yeah um training made anyway it's like it was made to make every you know carrot was an older one that was made to kind of um merge all the models into one kind of specification and then uh our studio hired max to kind of do it again normally like he had started doing parsnip already i think and they they said hey let's make a nice tidy system for modeling within our and uh that's what he's been doing um Tidy models is the latest and it includes parsnip and recipes and all these things. The book Tidy Modeling with R, tmwr.org, uh, is really useful for learning tidy models. Um, we are, <laughs> as soon as they write the last chapter, we will finish the first cohort of the book club for that book. Um, and it's been interesting to see uh, the book change as like he actually has been um, like watching some of our videos of the book club and seeing how we do with it because they started out teaching it kind of the old way where, you know, okay, you create a recipe and then you prep that recipe and you juice it and bake it and all these things. And he has now moved all the stuff of like the alternate way to work with recipes later in the book that workflows are the way that you should work with things. You create your re recipe, you create your model specification, and then you fit them together within a workflow. Um, and yeah, so the tidy models is parsnip recipes. Actually, let me just load it up here. That we've got um, broom. Uh, you can ignore some of these dials. Are so broom is when you have your model um, cleaning it up. To, to So Broom is also an, another old package, it predates tidy models, but it's for cleaning up the results of your, uh, your fit. Dials are different options for tuning um, things within a model. Dplyr we know, ggplot or separate. Um, hard hat is some stuff for uh, working with your model, like um, 
it's it's a lower lower importance package. So I'm going to skip to Parsnip uh, is the fitting. It's it's the actual modeling piece of tidy models. Recipes is the data preparation piece of tidy models. Um, our sample is specifically aimed at the sampling piece of um, taking resamples of your your data stuff that we're going to talk about in a couple of chapters. Um, And then uh, let's see, uh, tune is the one that is for setting hyperparameters in your models, which we'll talk about starting in a, maybe next week. Um, workflows is for combining all a bunch of, or sorry, is for combining the recipe and the model fit, or sorry, the recipe and the model specification into a single thing. And then workflow sets is for um, quickly creating lots of different models, different. So you might have a, a set of recipes and a set of workflows, or sorry, and a set of um, uh, model specifications, workflow sets lets you combine all those in different ways. And then yardstick is for measuring uh, performance of your model. Um, and then I skipped over a bunch of things, but there are other things in tidy models as well. Um, Oh, and we are over time now. So uh, there we go. <laughs> we, we, we can bring this up uh, next week. Oh, sorry. No, next week we are skipping. Um, this weekend, this coming weekend, uh, like Europe and uh, a lot of countries are switching from summertime to normal time. And then the following weekend, the US is. Because of that, I am... Um, Strongly encouraging all of the book clubs at R4DS to just skip a week because everyone's going to be at different times and it's a mess. So there will be no book club next week. The following week, we'll start chapter four. Uh, someone is signed up. I do not recall who that is, but um, I will be bugging them in the chat um, to make sure that they're ready to go. And we will continue on chapter four. And yes, if you, uh, if you are behind, you can catch up. If you haven't done some exercises like some people on this chat, uh, you can catch up with the exercises. Um, and uh, yeah, my Ling is signed up for chapter four. So we will do the first half of chapter four on the ninth. Um, the first half, I, who knows what that means. It's whatever you, we get through on day one. So uh, I recommend everyone try to read chapter four and be ready to go. And I will see you all in the chat. <laughs> all right, thank you, John. All right. Thank you. Thanks, John. Bye.